Hi, my name is Ashley and I'm a mom of two little girls. I have a five-year-old named Kylie and I also have a three-year-old named Mia. So some questions that I hear quite frequently from parents are things like, how do I get my child to play independently? Or how do I get my child to focus on an activity because their attention span is just all over the place? And you know what? Those are completely fair questions. But as Montessori parents, we have to remember that our role and our goal is not to get our child to do something. Because realistically speaking, unless you're using fear and punishment-based tactics, which we are not about, then you can't actually change another person's behavior. But what you do have control over is yourself and the environment. So those are the terms that we really need to be thinking in. And so the better question to ask is, how can I prepare the environment to make concentration possible? And then once that concentration is established, what do I need to do to help protect that concentration for my child? So from one busy parent to another, today I would like to take a deeper dive into how we can cultivate and protect our child's concentration in our Montessori home. Okay, so to start off, above everything else, we first have to remember that concentration is a skill. It's not this black or white, all or nothing, either you're born with it or you're not kind of a thing. It is a skill that can be learned and it can be honed and refined over time. Now I do recognize that children are all born with naturally varying levels in their ability to concentrate. So some children will find it naturally a lot easier and other children have to work at it a little bit more. But that means that your child is not stuck. Just because they can't concentrate right now doesn't mean that they will never be able to concentrate. They just have to work at it a little more. And along with that, they need opportunities to practice. So as the adult in their life, we have to have this growth mindset that our child can get there and we have to prepare the environment to make that possible. Now, whenever I talk to a parent about something like this, I'm always wishing inside that there was just this silver bullet magical answer that would solve all of their problems. You know, here, do this and your child will magically be able to concentrate. But unfortunately, as I'm sure you all already know, it's a lot more nuanced than that. And it is a process. It's not something that happens overnight. But the good news is there are some very practical things that you can be doing to make sure that you're giving your child the best opportunity possible. So what are those things? I am so glad you asked. Let's talk about it. The first thing that you need to do, honestly, I think this is the most important because it's also the most often overlooked, is to make time for concentration to happen. Your child needs free play time where they are uninterrupted. Nothing is scheduled. There's no play date. There's no after school soccer practice, nothing like that going on. Just time to be and to explore what it is that interests them. And honestly, it's like you have to leave time for them to potentially get bored. You know, boredom is not a horrible thing. I know we feel that way sometimes as parents. It almost feels like we're not doing our job if our child is bored. But think of boredom as a gift. It's an opportunity for your child to get creative and find something that they truly find engaging and interesting. And when they hit that sweet spot, that's when they're going to start to experience the joys of actually concentrating on something. So it's really important for us to consciously carve out this time for our child each and every day. Otherwise, we're starting off by doing them a really major disservice because they're not even going to have the opportunities to try. And I do recognize that there are so many of you out there who are super hardworking families, you lead very busy lives, and you're thinking to yourself, where am I going to find the time for this, Ashley, honestly? But I would encourage you to remember that this is part of the problem. If our child is constantly being shuffled from one thing to the next and they don't even have a second to breathe, then that's not doing anything to help them with this ability to concentrate. We want them to get deep into a flow with something that they're really interested in. So do what you can to find, you know, like 10, 15, 20 minutes. It doesn't have to be this big, long to do, just little chunks of time where your child can actually start to work on this and give them those times, you know, in the evenings, maybe on the weekends when you have a bit of a looser schedule and really try to fit it in because it is a gift for your child. The next thing that you can be focusing on is to make sure that you're offering age appropriate activities and experiences that are tailored to your child's unique interests. 
Sometimes we get overwhelmed with all the things that we see on social media. Everything looks cool and exciting and we think, wow, our child really is gonna like this. But then when push comes to shove, we spend all the time preparing it and put it on the shelf and our child doesn't even look at it for more than two seconds. And it can be really disheartening. So I would encourage you to, instead of spending hours and hours and hours online looking for ideas, use that time to sit back and watch your child. Observe your child, see what it is that actually interests them. What kinds of books do they like to read? Are there certain topics that draw their attention? Are they really excited about vehicles or dinosaurs or animals? Whatever their interest is, go with that. That is really useful information. The more you can kind of cater to your child's interests, the more likely it is that they're going to stay engaged with those activities that you are preparing. Now, once you've carved out that time for concentration and you've prepared your child's environment with all the activities that you feel are best suited to you know, their readiness and their interests, then your next step is to let your child choose. Let your child be the one to go over to the shelf to select a work and then take it to the table or the floor, or wherever it is that they choose to work, but let them be the one to choose. Because if we're being honest, sitting your child down and forcing them to do an activity that they're not really all that interested in is not the best way to inspire the kind of concentration that we're after. Yes, your child may be very good natured about it and sit down with you and go through the activity once or twice, but that's not true concentration. True concentration comes from your child actually going over to the shelf, seeing something that catches their eye and deciding for themselves, I want to touch these materials. I want to figure this out and do it myself. And then they take it to the table or the floor, wherever, and they sit down and they work with the materials on their own. That is the ideal situation. So whenever possible, try not to force your child to do an activity just because you're excited about it. I know sometimes it can be really hard when we spend a long time preparing an activity and we're excited to see our child do it. But really, like I said, they have to be the one to choose it if you truly want them to be engaged with it on that deep level that we're looking for. Now, with that said, yes, of course, you are still going to be introducing new activities to your child from time to time. There are some activities that don't really require much of like a lesson of any kind. It's something your child can just kind of play with and explore. And those are the kinds of things that you can just put out on the shelf and allow your child to discover it and figure out on their own how it works. But there are going to be some things where maybe they need a little bit of modeling, like a little demonstration of how it's supposed to work. And after that initial presentation, then like I said, you leave it on the shelf and you allow your child to choose it. It's not something that you say, hey, we need to do this activity today. Let's take it to a table and do it together. We want our child to be the one to take the initiative. All right, so once your child chooses an activity, they're sitting down, they're working with it, they are fully engaged for all intents and purposes. They're not looking at you. They're zero in on what they're doing. This next step is a crucial one, but it is also a really difficult one for a lot of parents. And that is to stop interrupting your child. And by interrupting, I mean for anything from a minor correction to something that we perceive that they're doing wrong, to a question about what they're doing, to praise them, any kind of comment that might come to mind for us, don't do it. These kinds of interruptions, although I know they are very well-intentioned on our part, are often actually really unhelpful and they actually impede our child's ability to concentrate. Because if you think about it from their perspective, like they're in their flow, they're doing their thing, and then here we come along with some random comment about what it is that they're doing, and they are now stopping what they're thinking about to pay attention to what we've just said, and so we're literally breaking their flow of concentration in that moment. And whether or not our child is actually able to get back into that flow and continue what they're doing, remains to be seen. I always try to remind parents to think of it from the child's perspective. If that were you, imagine yourself like in the middle of a really good book at like that part that you're really excited about, you wanna find out what's happening. Or maybe you're at work and you're working on some project that you've been really excited about, you're deep in your flow, you've got all these ideas happening and you're just trying to get them out as fast as possible. And then somebody walks in to ask you something random about you know, like, what are we having for lunch today? And you're like, ah, like it just, it, it's a really not helpful moment for anybody and especially for our children. So when your child is engaged with the activity that they've selected, what should you be doing? Well, your goal is to be the fly on the wall. You want to bite your tongue, 
sit on your hands and just quietly, silently observe your child. Just take it all in, appreciate the moment for what it is without intervening in any way. And if possible, ideally, as your child becomes accustomed to kind of working independently like this and really concentrating, you can walk away or even leave the room. That's the best scenario. I don't know about you, but I don't really work as well when I know someone is watching me as when I'm like, you know, alone and able to really dive into what I'm trying to focus on. And like I said, our children are not much different. So if you know that they'll be okay with you walking away or leaving the room and that's not going to disrupt their concentration, especially in the beginning stages, then by all means do so. You know, get out of there and let them have their time alone to concentrate. Now there are going to be times when you're going to be in the room while your child is working with an activity and they might pause and look up and make eye contact with you. Or maybe they're working through something for the first time or trying to figure something out and periodically as they're working, they'll stop and look at you almost like they're looking for feedback of some kind. And when those moments happen, I would encourage you to remember to keep it simple. You don't need to launch into an interrogation of what they're doing and making all kinds of comments and praise on the progress they've made thus far. That's not necessary. All you need to do is smile at them, you know, from wherever you are in the room. Often that's more than enough. Or maybe if they have just finished what they're working on and then they look up at you, you can just say, you did it and then just allow them to revel in that moment of accomplishment for themselves without looking to you for some kind of a, a judgment about their work. Or another alternative is to just describe what you see very briefly. So let's say your child was working on a water pouring activity for the first time and they get all the water into the cup and then they look up at you and you smile and maybe you say, you got all the water into the cup and that's it. Or maybe your child is, you know, sitting down and working on a block tower for the first time and they finally have gotten enough blocks stacked up that it feels like they've made some progress compared to the past and they look up at you and they're smiling and you can say, you did it, you got six blocks to stack. Again, just leave it at that. It doesn't need to be this big long to do, just a simple acknowledgement of what you see. By keeping your response nonverbal or very minimal at best, you're giving your child an opportunity to stay in that flow, to get back into their concentration and to keep working. Whereas if we get really wordy and launch into this big long you know, thing about whatever is going on through our heads as we're watching them, then they're more likely to lose interest and move on to something else. Now let's say that this is the first time that your child has actually completed an activity. Maybe you just introduced it and they've worked through it on their own for the first time. This is a really good opportunity to help them learn how to concentrate for longer periods of time by extending an invitation for them to repeat the activity. Because sometimes our children don't think of this on their own, but if you ask them, they're like, yeah, I'll do it again. So it's really simple. You know, let's say your child just finished a puzzle for the very first time. They look up, they're really excited, they're smiling, and you smile back and you say, you did it. Would you like to do it again? And then they might be like, yeah, let's do it. So just giving them that invitation to maybe try the activity again can be a way to help lengthen that concentration. And then one other kind of interruption that you really want to try to avoid whenever possible, I know it won't always be possible, but when you can, is to give your child a little bit of extra time to wait before you begin a transition if you see that they're really immersed in something. So let's just go with an example here because I know that helps. Let's say your child is fully immersed in playing with their train tracks. They've spent all this time building an elaborate track and they've got the cars going around and they're excited about what they're doing, but we know that lunch is about to be served in five, 10 minutes, okay? And oftentimes we are all about our schedules. That's how we are as adults. And so we go over and we say, hey buddy, lunch is in five minutes. And without any regard for what our child is doing because we just want them to know lunch is coming. And there's nothing wrong with that except that we may have completely interrupted our child's flow of thought, their concentration in what they were doing. So maybe instead of barging in and saying, hey, this transition is coming up, maybe we actually take a moment to stop and pause and observe what is our child doing right now. And if we notice that they're fully immersed in their activity, then maybe we check our watch and say, okay, I think I do maybe have a couple of extra minutes to let him finish up what he's doing before I tell him that lunch is on the table or whatever the transition is that's about to happen. And so we wait for an opportune time 
to let them know. So maybe we wait for our child to look up from what they're doing and to make eye contact with us from across the room. That's a good time to go in and say, hey buddy, just so you know, we're gonna be having lunch in about five minutes. And then we can at least reassure ourselves in good conscience that we made an effort to not interrupt their concentration. Now, like I said, I know that this is not always going to be possible because life happens and sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do and it has to happen now and there isn't any time to wait. Or on the flip side of that, your child also needs to know that life is not always going to wait on them. But my point is, if you are making the effort more often than not to give your child those opportunities, then that is going to be immensely helpful. And then finally, one other thing that you can do to help your child learn how to concentrate is really something that is going to come from within on your part. And that is to respect what your child chooses to concentrate on. And this is going to look different depending on how old your child is. You know, an infant may choose to stare at the shadows on the wall for 20 minutes, or they may spend 10, 15 minutes just engaging with the mobile that you've hung over their movement area. Or maybe they're just starting to be a little more mobile and they find this really interesting little crumb on the floor and they're just, you know, going crazy with it, investigating it, looking at it, feeling it between their fingers. And they're, they're happy to do that for like 10 or 15 minutes straight. Or maybe you have a toddler who is really interested in going back and forth and back and forth, carrying little buckets or pails of water from one place to another outside or maybe they're really busy lining up their animals or their cars just so, so that they're perfect in their mind and they spend upwards of 20, 30 minutes doing just this one activity. Or maybe your preschooler is actually selecting an activity, a puzzle off of the shelf and they're sitting down and they're putting the puzzle together or they're building a really elaborate magnetile structure. You know, it's going to look different what concentration looks like as your child grows. But what you need to realize as the adult is this is what my child has chosen to concentrate on in the moment. And so this is meaningful work for them. It may look insignificant to you. You may not understand why they are so fascinated with what they've picked, or maybe you do, but a lot of the times we don't, and we just have to go with it. We just have to recognize that if this activity is allowing our child to remain this engaged and this concentrated for this long of a period of time, that is an activity that is calling to some inner developmental urge that they have in that moment. And so, it's important work for them. Now, like I said earlier, this doesn't mean that you are not introducing new activities to your child on their shelf or new experiences that they might be interested in. You are absolutely still doing that, but I don't want you to go into it expecting miracles. Sometimes we hit the nail right on the head and our child is super excited and engaged in the activities that we're providing. And sometimes we miss the mark. You know, a lot of this Montessori parenting thing is about observing and some trial and error, a little bit of guesswork, you know, a little bit of self-education and knowing what to look for, but a little bit of trial and error along the way too. And trying something out and seeing if it works. And if it doesn't, then that doesn't mean you failed. That means that that's useful information that you can now take and go back to the drawing board and figure out and say, okay, that this didn't work, but what else can I try instead that I haven't maybe considered yet? What other things can I offer my child that actually might interest them? You really just wanna focus on finding solutions when that happens instead of beating yourself up over it not going well. So in a nutshell, to sum all of this up for you, as a Montessori parent, what you really wanna focus on is first, how can you prepare your child's environment to make these moments of concentration possible in the first place? And then once your child is actually engaged in those moments of concentration, we are doing everything that we can to protect that concentration like a fierce mama bear. So I hope you found these tips for cultivating and protecting your child's concentration to be helpful. If you did, then be sure to give this video a thumbs up. If you'd like more practical tips and advice for implementing Montessori at home with your children, then you might consider subscribing to my channel. This way you don't miss a new video. My new book, The Montessori Home, Create a Space for Your Child to Thrive is now available in both paperback and ebook on Amazon and in all major book retailers. I also offer several e-courses, an online community just for Montessori parents and live video consultations. Links to all of those resources are in the description box down below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.